Um, first of all, welcome guys. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a minute each to introduce himself, uh, what you guys do, and uh, what's your connection to Lean Startup. So, Liad? Hi, Liad Agmon. Uh, I uh, founded Onigma in 2004, a security company, sold to McAfee in 2006. Uh, founded Delver, a social search company. Um, barely sold it to Sears in January 2009. Uh, right now, I'm the CEO of a new startup called Dynamic Yield that increases revenue for premium publishers. And uh, I'm sitting physically at Bessemer Venture Partners, where I was a, an EIR for the last uh, almost two years. Oh, and I teach um, in Tel Aviv University MBA program, the entrepreneurship course, and in the Zell program in IDC. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is, uh, sorry, give him the applause. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Chetel Olsen, probably the only person in the room today, which is called Chetel. Um, I'm a Norwegian. Um, I work, for, uh, work as the vice president of Europe for Elance.com. Um, Elance is the world's leading online work platform. It's a place where businesses come to tap into a huge pool of talent within all disciplines that can be performed remotely and online, whether that is programmers, it's uh, writers, uh, copywriters, translators, designers, etc. And then on the other side, we also serve the market for freelancers. So freelancers, talents all across the world come to Elance to find job opportunities. Uh, for startups, it's a great way to build a lean and agile uh, startup um, in a good way. You save a lot of money. You can gain flexibility. You also have access to a great pool of talent all over the world. So that's us. Thank you. So uh, Elance and Utest are like uh, cousins. Uh, Utest is the uh, in the wild the testing uh, company. We're focused in uh, testing. Uh, I'm Ran, uh, general manager of Utest Israel. Uh, Utest uh, works with many startups, many of them also in this room. And uh, what we provide is uh, testing services at the target markets with uh, real people, uh, professionals, uh, and uh, providing uh, UX testing, localization, functional testing. Very much focused on the product lifecycle and release, uh, release methods. And uh, our connection to uh, Lean Startup is the ability to uh, reach out to the real world get uh, real evidence and, and genuine indication from your, uh, uh, the place where your application should prove itself with real people, real devices, and the real world environment. Uh, okay, so most people here, uh, raise your hands if you know what Lean Startup is. Okay, that's too few of a people. Um, so raise your hand if you practice Lean Startup. That's even less. Uh, so, we we'll start with you, Liad. Um, can you please explain in a few words what is Lean Startup, how it got started, just, you know, to get people familiar? Yes. So, uh, first of all, Lean Startup methodology is really a marketing spiel of uh, Eric Ries and his team uh, that managed to make a lot of money uh, from that. So, I, uh, so I want to make a differentiation between the Lean Startup uh, as a marketing term and really what Lean Startups are. So. Um, Lean startup at the end of the day uh, means that um, you have very limited resources. It could be budget, it could be uh, people, it could be time. And you need at any given moment in time, make a decision what is the most important thing that you must focus on. And what evidence uh, in startup community has uh, demonstrated in the last uh, 30, 40 years is what you must concentrate on is to gain empirical evidence that your initial thesis is actually um, working out and by meaning that your initial thesis every startup starts with an idea you think that your pro your product is going to solve a real world problem or that it's going to solve a real world need now as long as you are in your lab and you're developing your product you are actually not empirically testing to see if it's right so if I have to summarize the lean startup thinking it is that you have to go out there and face customers literally from day one you build something which is very fast, very quick. Lots of features of your vision are going to be left outside because the most critical factor is to get customer feedback. And once you shape your company around customer feedback, everything starts to fall into place. A lot of your assumptions either are, prove, are proved right or are proved wrong, and then you have to make changes. And the nice thing is, if you do it very early on in the product, changing is very, very cheap. 
You don't have to deploy 20 engineers to make a change if after three months you realize that the direction has to be a bit different. Uh, so following up on what you said, uh, Liad, uh, Jatil, can you please, you know, uh, as Liad said, startups, you know, they have to start fast, get feedback as, as fast as they can. And uh, some, some followers of Lean Startup even say that raising money is, is a disturbance for startups at this stage, meaning it, the money actually gets in the way because they spend it too fast on things that they don't need and they don't really do what they do in such an early stage. How, how do you think startups should do in, in, in the early stages? I think most of the, the resources in a startup, whether that is time, people, or money, should be focused in on, on building the right product, or building the service that you want to have out in the market. Uh, but I think it's actually good to use the investors in an early phase, that you pitch your idea, you pitch your hypothesis to them in an early phase. So in order to get the feedback, in order to also develop the product in, in, in the way, or the service in the way that also the investor wants it, because they are kind of a customer of yours as well. Um, but then kind of use them constantly, use investors or people that are, are related to investors, and then you move on to, to develop your product, continue, go as far as you can, and then at some point of time, then you then go back to the investors and raise the capital needed based on the feedback that you got from your kind of future clients, future users, and also potential investors. Um, also, I think you need to look at, uh, at your kind of the company stocks as a, a scary resource which you really have to kind of keep in the company as long as possible before you kind of share them out. Of course, there is a balance. Um, but. Okay. Um, Ran, people say that Lean Startup, whether we're talking about the marketing pitch or, or the real methodology, uh, is actually somehow a child of, of the internet generation. Um, how did the internet really affect uh, company development regarding to Lean Startup? And does it only work on, on internet and mobile, or can it be applied to other startups as well? I think this is a generic concept that can work in any way. And basically, if we look uh, historically, there is a concept called lean manufacturing. And lean manufacturing started from the automotive industry. And if, if we take it one-on-one, -on -one, lean startup uh, concepts and uh, you know, knowledge is taking lots of ideas from lean manufacturing of uh, huge uh, organizations. So uh, basically when I'm looking at a startup uh, or uh, any technology organization, uh, regardless of the size, uh, I can picture, because we're working with hundreds of startups here in Israel, and uh, I can see if the startup is behaving as a lean organization, and then this is like part of the DNA of this organization growing. Also when the company is growing and becoming big company, uh, in what sense? In, in the sense that not wasting money, but spending money, uh, thinking all the time what is the really important thing and the really important challenge in front of uh, the company. These are generic messages. It, okay. it, it doesn't only belong to the internet uh, eco ecosystem or, or domain or, or, or startups. It's something that can be part of the organization culture. And I think uh, eventually it's, uh, it can be adopted by big organizations. Also today we can see governments that are starting to adopt uh, lean uh, concepts. Okay. Uh, um, mainly terrorist groups, they use a lot of these <laughs> type of methodologies. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, basically uh, with what you guys said, uh, lean startup is actually creating a minimum viable product um, as fast as possible, taking it out into the wild as soon as possible, fail as soon as possible, uh, learn, improve, and go all, all over again. Um, how, as an entrepreneur with a huge idea, going to change the world, be the next Facebook, how do you decide what's the minimum viable product? What, what are you going to get out to the market with? I think that's the most amazing challenge about lean startups is that you have to crystallize your idea. It's almost like a diamond to the core essence of it and understand it. And sometimes feature creep is created when you're not really sure what is the true value of your product. So you're throwing a lot of extra features, a lot of extra capabilities. But if you're able to define and basically to say in one sentence, what is the value proposition of your startup? This is the actual feature uh, that you're doing. And I can give an example from my current startup. Uh, we are three employees right now, uh, completely self-funded. Um, we have uh, some of the biggest publishers in Israel as customers and some European publishers as well. And we don't have a user interface. 
initially I wanted to create a lot of good reports and nice stats and everything that looks really fancy. But then I realized that for my customers, what really matters is that I make more money for them. So the user interface feature has been postponed for the last six months, and we keep postponing it just because there are better tasks in order of creating value for customers. So we try, um, and when I teach, I try um, not to confuse um, value with features and or with fancy stuff. And I think Facebook, as, a, as, an, as an amazing company, it started as a lean startup. I mean, the guy just wanted to find chicks in, uh, in, in Harvard. Wrong university for that, I guess. But uh, this is where it starts. All the big, interesting internet phenomena started as something small. And when we all know the stories of eBay, or I don't know how many of you know the story of Dropbox, where way before they had the product ready, they had a, a three-minute YouTube video, which they posted to, um, to, I think it was to Reddit, uh, or Dig, or, or Hacker News. I forgot which one they, they posted it to. And they had 75,000 bit better requests before they even had their product ready. So um, to, um, to finalize what MVP, I'm... The MVP was the movie. The MVP was the movie. And this is what, in many startups, you can actually learn from. I always am, am in favor of reversing the process. Instead of building a product and trying to find your customers, find the customers and then build the product. It's going to save you a lot, lots of months of development and also lots of money. Okay, so Liad, you, you had uh, uh, UI missing. You didn't have UI in the beginning. Most of startups, when they begin, you know, they have businessmen, maybe a couple of designers. They always have uh, a skill missing. So following the lean startup, should, should they use, uh, what should they do in the beginning? Should they use freelancers to save money? Should they just go out and do it as fast as they can and, and save something? Uh, you know, Jatil, as, as the freelance expert here, uh, what's your opinion? So, of course, they should use online freelancers from Elon's. Uh, that's, that's clear. Um, no, I think, um, so kind of just taking the assumption that most startups are bootstrapped, uh, which in reality they are yeah. uh, in 99.9% in .9 of the cases, I think. Uh, so, so a lot of things, kind of maybe a mock-up or, or whatever it is, won't be developed uh, by people because they just have, don't have the funds or the skills to do that. And in those cases uh, where you want to prove an idea, it could be wisely to spend a few dollars on, on finding a freelancer that can create a mock-up, can do some better, uh, make a better product for you, uh, just so that you have something to show to the market. Uh, and of course, at a later point of time, you should, of course, then use uh, freelancers or flexible workforce really to tap into very narrow skill sets uh, that you can use to build your business. Uh, you can find somebody that helps you to that are kind of located various places across the world in different time zones so that you're able to utilize the full 24 hours of a day instead of kind of something that would normally take 72 hours. Then you can rather spread some people across the world so that you're able to utilize the 24 seven instead of only the eight hours ordinary work days. So it's a good way to kind of, because also time is a scarce resource again. So if you're able to utilize the time zones, it's a kind of gives you a lot back. Yeah, or you could just find someone to make a movie, a freelancer to make a movie for you. Of That's al also an option. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ron, tell us a little bit about, um, as the testing expert, one of the things that Lean Startup says is you should actually put your product out as soon as possible and let the wild test it. So, if you're, if you're testing, on the, one, on the other hand, if you're not testing your product and you're getting a product uh, very buggy, uh, with, with tons of malfunctions and things that don't work outside, your users will see it once and won't come back later, maybe. So where does, where does the line cross? Where, what's too much testing and what's too little? I would say that, uh, that uh, any action that you're taking should serve the purpose, right? And you wish uh, to uh, put your uh, concept and your vision to, to the real world test. So basically, you don't want quality issues to take too much attention uh, from your end users. You want the vision and the concept that you're uh, bringing to the world to take the most uh, attention. And uh, for, for my, uh, in, in my point of view, uh, you should, uh, of course, limit the actions of testing and you should uh, budget it properly. Uh, however, you should uh, leave uh, some room and space for this uh, activity. 
uh, and specifically uh, when you are considering to add another feature or another uh, something which could be considered as nice to have. Even a, a good indication for me as a Lean startup uh, releasing a, 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 a minimal viable product that is part of the vision is left out. You intentionally leaving part of your vision out and leaving some of it or the, or the majority of it in and you're polishing and testing properly your minimal viable product to keep the attention to, the, to that part of your vision that you did uh, decide to, uh, to put out right now and then you get your feedback and then you decide what, you, what you're doing with the, with the rest of your vision. Maybe you will abandon it, maybe you will incorporate it to the later stage. Or you just pivot. Yeah, but, but you're not insisting on bringing everything. I can see it, startups, and I, I witnessed, I, I'm coming to a startup, I have an address, uh, I never heard about it before, I'm open the door, opening the door, and I see 100 people working, amazing. They are in stealth mode for... 100 people. 100 people, yeah, in, for, for uh, a year. I can tell you, this is not a lean startup. And they are not working on a minimal viable product. And you know, in our world, for me to see something like that, which is amazing, I don't think it is such a good indication. I would prefer to see some people, a few people in a room, uh, working on something, polishing it, which is really uh, lean and, and limited, and put it out and, and getting uh, validated feedback. Um, I want my, my rule of thumb is if you are not ashamed of your product, you waited for too long. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, the, the, there are two, two uh, separate approaches. One saying it is too, too late, and, if you're, and the other one says exactly the opposite. Um, you know, someone asked me if uh, stealth mode is no longer something that uh, is, is, is a valid concept. I think it is, it is still there. There are companies in stealth mode, but you can see le uh, it, it, it declining. I want, I want to get, uh, for the last question, I want to get each and every one of you perspective on, on what do entrepreneurs need to do with knowledge regarding lean startup? How should they start? And what's your tip to keep their company as lean as possible to get them to success? So, um First of all is to read the books on the subject. I think uh, um, Four Steps to the Epiphany is really an amazing book in terms of its concept. It's horribly boring and very hard to read. So the new uh, the Eric Ries book, which is a student of the professor who wrote the Four Steps to the Epiphany, the book called Lean Startup is actually a very good starting point. And there are lots of blogs on this subject. Another uh, very, very good book, uh, which I recommend, uh, is called The Business Model Generation which talks about different criteria, different types of business models, and what is the implication for your company. Uh, it's, a, it's a very fun book to read. Um, and I think it's, it's really understanding these concepts of customer development, uh, which is the key for becoming lean. And once you understand what's important in the life cycle of your product, suddenly everything falls into place. Sorry. So I'm not an expert on, on lean startups, but I think uh, I, I completely agree with what you say. Kind of study the topic, understand it, and, and make a decision whether that is something that you will go fully into or if you kind of have is it disloyal to the, the concept. So it's either or. That's what I think. Um, and kind of, kind of coming from the, the online work platform market, so uh, what I see is really how can you, as uh, kind of an entrepreneur, really use these online freelancers to really build your kind of lean startup. That's, that's what I would say. Okay. Uh, on, on the practical uh, level, uh, of course, knowledge and gaining the knowledge is very important. Uh, uh, I think uh, w what I can see is from my experience is basically, uh, you know, money is the fuel of, uh, of an organization. And uh, for me, lean startup is not about being cheap or trying not to, uh, not to spend money. It's about trying not to waste money and work with the money that you have and spend it wisely. So it means that uh, the management of the, of the uh, startup is becoming a practice uh, that is very important. And the startup can less be technology driven or technology vision driven, driven and more product driven. And, uh, and uh, the considerations at each and every step, you'll find out that are more by a teamwork uh, rather than, again, uh, technology is leading and uh, running very, very fast, not exactly knowing all, all the time where to. 
So I think uh, this is the, uh, uh, and then you can see that uh, the management and the decision making and the, and the way uh, the startup is using the budget they do have uh, is a very good indication for right, uh, right approach or a lean startup approach with good chances to succeed. I, um, I, I have something to add. Um, there is a phenomena which uh, I see happening in the last couple of years and a lot of uh, VCs also see it is because the barrier to entry today for startups is much, much lower. You don't need to raise $3 million and have a 25 people team. And sometimes two or three people teams are enough to create a product. Um, what I witness is sometimes um, um, people spend a lot of time, I'm maybe a year of their lives, in building products that actually are not going to be successful. And, um, and uh, there was a question about raising money from investors. Um, I personally, uh, I think investors are, are very, very smart individuals at that they have something which we as entrepreneurs don't, and, and it is they have perspective. They see 100, 200 companies, maybe sometimes 500 companies per year, and they can already understand and they see which models work and they know what questions to ask. So I also like practicing on investors. So when I go and I pitch my company, I listen very carefully to the questions which they've asked, and I go back and I do my homework on these questions because the questions that they asked are the results of hundreds of companies that they've seen throughout the years grow from small teams to huge corporations. And they already know what difficulties you're going to face even a few years ahead of you. So um, don't treat investor questions as nuances, but really as guidance in many cases to what questions you have to solve for yourself and for your own business. Because um, investors don't like to fund risk. They like to fund growth. And in startups, uh, in the fir early stages of a startup, the risk is really very high. Um, I can give you an example, just my reaction of the previous presentation, uh, the Communit uh, com uh, presentation. Communit. Uh, Communit. Um, you know, when, when he, uh, I didn't know this company before, he started explaining what they're doing. Uh, it sounded like a pitch I heard many times before. The moment I saw a slide where he said, you know, I had, I don't remember the number of customers. At the moment I see he has 500 customers and let's say that even only 20% of these customers are paying. For me, this is the most important slide because it means that his vision, his thesis is appealing for a certain number of users who are actually willing to pay for that. And from that moment onwards, the only question I have in mind is can it scale? Not anymore if is it working? because people actually spend money on, the, on his product, but how to scale this product? And a lot of these questions today are about scaling. And when you're talking about consumer products, which a lot of uh, uh, people in this room are working on, scaling to 100,000 users in the consumer world is almost uh, negligible. That's the sad reality. Uh, Chris Dixon uh, from New York had an amazing blog post which said, uh, 10 million is the new 1 million. Okay, if you think about the mathematics of startups and how do you generate revenues, a million consumers is not a big company. Facebook is making $5 per user per year with all its infrastructure and scale. So if you get to a company that makes $5 million a year, it can be amazing if it's a bootstrapped company. But for venture capital or investors uh, that, um, uh, that have uh, deep pockets, it, these numbers are just very, very small. So this is also something to take into consideration. Thank you very much, guys.